Um, the, the next um, session is the circular economy and demand reduction and um, a keynote speech is from Oshin Smith, um, who is uh, a Green Party politician who served as Minister of State since July 2020. Um, he's been a TD for Dunleary since 2020. He was appointed Minister of State at the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform with responsibility for public procurement and e-government and Minister of State at the Department of the uh, Environment with responsibility for the for communications and which, of course, is most important for us here today, the circular economy. Thank you, Ashley. Okay, hello everybody. Thank you very much, Michael. And um, it's nice to see so many familiar faces. The circular economy, there's a problem with it. Problem with the, the naming, I suppose, the branding, because it's too abstract ideas. It's, you know, that's something being circular, which is too many syllables to get across and being an economy. And um, I think it really helps if you can quickly skip to the examples of what it really means in, in, in the real world. So it, it, circular economy means that instead of uh, going to a cheap shop to buy to buy clothing that you're going to um, the charity shop and that when you get shoes in the charity shop and they wear out that instead of buying new ones made in a sweatshop on the other side of the world that you go around to your local shoemaker and you get them fixed and then you get your clothes altered and that you get your bike fixed and that everything is that you, you try to renovate and that you you reach for an idea that there is um, that one of the, the pleasures of, of get things and looking after things and buying things can doesn't have to be about brand something being brand new. It doesn't have to be about unboxing. Uh, it doesn't have to be about taking home a haul of goods out of new, new bags with branded with the name of the shop. But you can also have an immense pleasure from taking your old goods and fixing them up. The ones that have that uh, that that have have worn in to fit you and that have some heritage and some emotional connection for you or that you've got it from your family and now you're you're giving it a new lease of life and that that can be a, a way that you can uh that you can signal to other people your 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 uh your taste and your eclecticism rather than appearing and saying look i've got something brand new from that from that brand so i think there is a cultural challenge to shift people's um uh, shift shift people's idea of uh, what it means to to provide for themselves and their family in a way uh, which is which is which is not wasteful. So I think we're kind of pushing an open door here. Uh, for a long time, there was a general consensus that um, our our prosperity and our wealth in the world were about the success of capitalism, and that what we had to do was we had to consume as much as possible. I need to remember George Bush telling people that we to avoid the recession, we all had to go shopping. And there was an idea that if anybody like Michael or me said, hold on a second, maybe GDP is not a good measure of wealth, that you are a, a crazy hippie and that you should be shunned uh, for your silly ideas. And then eventually the whole the whole edifice of GDP sort of collapsed. And, you know, I remember, you know, there was this idea every quarter, well, GDP has gone up half percent, we're half percent better, or it's gone down half percent, we should be worried. And then one day, I think Irish GDP went up 25 percent and the CSO and everybody had to say, oh, this, this, this is all rubbish, isn't it? And it doesn't actually, it doesn't, it doesn't work at all. And we've got to find another way of, of measuring whether we're prosperous. And that, that this idea that we can measure our prosperity based on how fast we are consuming our finite resources is a stupid idea. And that that is, it, it doesn't make sense to say, the faster you eat the food in your cupboards in your kitchen, the the, the, the richer your family is. That, that's, that's just not true. So we've won the kind of, we've won that kind of argument. And there's a general consensus from people that consumerism is not the route to happiness. That if you have two of something, you're not twice as happy as you were than when you when you had one. Uh, it's in fact it's more rubbish to look after. And even that even IKEA eventually said that we'd reach peak stuff. And everybody knows, you know, stuff is stuff is not going to make you not going to make you happy. Um, so we're we're there in the abstract, but we're obviously not there at the individual level. And still, still, it's it's very hard to get past, um, uh, you know, to 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 make those individual changes and say, okay, I accept that. I shouldn't uh, that, that buying a lot of stuff isn't going to make me happy, but I'm you know I'm I'm still doing it. I'm still borrowing money to, to buy stuff. So, so we're 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 at that point. We're we're at the point where the general idea is agreed and the goals, but we we've got to do the we've got to do the action plan. How do we persuade people for this circular economy stuff? So, um, and I see this in the report. You know, when you're trying to persuade people about things, you've got different groups of people, and you need to address their values. So it's easy for me, I suppose, it's, it's, it's with a group of people who are young and progressive 
you might speak to them about circular economy in terms of the environment and the future and climate action, but maybe with a, with a more conservative group of people, you might be appealing to the values of their parents and grandparents. And using that approach that I went, brought the circular economy um, uh, bill to the Doyle, I was able to get people from every party, including the rural independents who generally will oppose anything that I do, even if the, even if the opposition are on side, but it got them to, to agree to it because they said, oh yeah, that's the way things used to happen where we used to get our shoes fixed and whatever else. So, 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 so being able to appeal to that, those values meant, to get, meant that we got a very broad uh, consensus. Um, so on an individual basis though, when, when we're looking at uh, the getting people to agree to projects in their local area, um, there is a real there is a real problem. It's really heartbreaking when you're trying to get things done in your area and people are coming up and opposing them. So if you can think of something as simple as closing off the street outside the local school during school start the start of the school day and the, the school pick up and the drop off. So you just say, well, why can we close the hundred yards from under the school? And I, I guess the problem that we're having is that we put out an idea and we say, let's have a public consultation about it, and then. People start to imagine all kinds of terrible things in the future, and they discuss it for years, and sometimes literally two years, three years of discussion about something that you just really want to try for a few months. So I think we, we, what we really need to do is move towards uh, um, a different emergency governance to, you know, to take it into account that, we're, that this is a, a, an emergency and that there's a climate crisis, and that we say, look, if we're going to try something out, like close the road in front of the school, we should just do it. Um, and we'll just announce it that we're going to do it next week and we'll try it out for we'll try it out for six months and then we'll put it back the way it was and then you can have your consultation so we're consulting about something that we've tried not something that we're imagining for the future because what i found is that in, in my local area when i surveyed people and i got a professional firm to survey it they were actually very very much in favor of a lot of the projects i was trying to do but the people who were against the projects had louder voices they were more intense they were more on social media and they gave the impression and also to the broadcast media that they were a majority. So I have a kind of a silent majority supporting and I have a minority who are kind of acting in a tyrannical way. So that's that's my that's my challenge to get past that. And so I want to move towards if we're thinking about what's emergency governance which is covered in this I think something where we can we can do something and have the have the consultation afterwards. There's a couple of things happening in Europe that are encouraging. One is um, the idea of durability ratings. So you go to buy a washing machine and um, you, you see an array of machines and you're picking based on brand or you're picking based on super features that it's gonna wash using AI or whatever. And really, you're not really making an informed choice and you don't know whether the product is gonna last a long time or whether it's got built-in obsolescence. So the, one of the ideas from the EU is that they are going to have an independent body testing all the consumer equipment and giving it a rating for how many years it's going to last. So, uh, so you you go in and you see this washing machine lasts for five years. This one lasts for ten years. And now, as a consumer, you can make. So I shouldn't say the word consumer. As a citizen, you can make you can make an ins informed choice. As this is this is the, I'm I'm going to buy this one, which lasts twice which lasts twice as long. Um, and you know when I discussed that at a, at a at, with business people, one of them said, "Well, what if I own a washing machine factory and I only get to sell half as many washing machines as I did before?" And that's the vested interest angle. Is uh, you know th this thing you're trying to bring in is gonna it's gonna lower it's gonna lower my it's gonna lower bit my business or businesses overall. But of course, it creates a new opportunity, which is the opportunity for the whole business of renovation and repair, and a lot of that work is local rather than being globalized. We're also kind of got a fair wind on the whole globalization thing. Because globalization is obviously falling apart. Uh, thank you very much, Donald Trump, for imposing uh, trade tariffs on loads of different countries all at the same time, which made co companies say, okay, we've got to put our own factories in each continent. Then the pandemic, uh, uh, just destroying trade lines in China and everything else. And now the war in Ukraine. And really, we got to a point where if you, you, you just can't rely on very, or it looks like that the business world can't rely on fragile, complex, long distance supply chains. And they're thinking we've got to make things more locally and, and create things locally. So there's a, there's a challenge to the whole idea of, um, of globalization, I think is really, is really starting, to, starting to shatter. And I think that, so, so what's gonna happen instead, I, I think is a lot, more, um, a lot more local stuff, a lot more services, a lot more fixing things in your, in your local area and a lot less waiting for a, a, a container of stuff to arrive from the other side of the world. How are we doing on circularity in Ireland? Really badly. So I think we're second last in, in Ireland, in, in Europe, on Eurostat circularity index 
I don't say that very much, but we are. And um, when I looked at the details of it, because we don't mine, we don't really have much mines. We have like tar or something. Um, but what we do is we scrape a lot of aggregate and uh, we take, you know, we, we, we scrape off drumlands. And until recently, of course, we were stripping the bogs and everything. But we strip, we, so our construction industry involves a lot of, a lot more raw materials than in other countries in Europe, even on a comparative basis. Um, we ship all our waste or most of our waste, although it gets sorted here, most of it ends up being sent abroad, a lot of it um, burnt abroad. And, uh, and so, you know, we, we've, we, we have a lot, we have a long way to go. I've put in the law that we need to reach above European average in eight years time. And when I look at what the big bits are to do, it's not coffee cups. That's the bit that, you know, obviously that the media were interested in, but the, the biggest one is construction. So if we're going to build loads and loads of houses for people, are we going to build them in a green way? Are we going to uh, renovate the existing stock? Are we going to are we going to have low embodied carbon? Are we going to reuse materials? When we knock down old things, are we are we taking all the rubble and throwing it in a field, or are we recycling concrete and so on? So that's going to, that's that's the largest opportunity area is construction and development for improving our uh, our circularity. Those little things like coffee cups and vapes, they're things that people can relate to. And I suppose you know they do on their own. Each one of them is so tiny, you know, plastic bags, whatever. But it is worth doing each one of them because they are something that you can you can relate to uh, in your own life. And people do want to have a sense of um, a sense that they have a role in all this and that they have some kind of control. I'm very heartened by what I saw in California, where when they were reaching their um, they, 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 their electricity network looked like it was reaching peak and that they, that they might have blackouts. And they sent texts out to people and said, in your area, we might, we might be reaching a blackout. Can you find things to turn off around your house? And um, the response was phenomenal. And um, I think, uh, you know, you see a huge drop very quickly. But, and you could see that people then uh, felt that they had managed to avert a problem, that they had some agency in it, that they were given the information. And also it, it, the message was sent to everybody, whether you're a child or an elderly person, and everybody can, can, can have, a, have an act in that because everybody can look around and, and turn something off or do something. So I'm looking at um, how we can do that here as well. So there you go, that's my unprepared words on this. And if you ever want to talk to me about circular economy and you have ideas about uh, how it should be running better, um, I, I, I love to hear them because mostly everything that I've ever done is any good has always been a suggestion from someone else. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um.